In the final episode of our three-part series on the fall of Gondolin, we will recount the culmination of Turgon's arrogance and Maeglin's treachery. The prophecy of the Valar was to be proven true, for not by mortal hands would the Dark Lord be laid low. In attempting to defy Morgoth's hegemony over Middle-earth, Gondolin's name was to be etched and engraved alongside that of Doriath and Nagathrond in the list of shattered kingdoms of the First Age. With so much detail to this world and its history, it's hard to imagine writing something like this for yourself, but with a little modern software, it's actually easier than ever. Use our sponsor, World Anvil. This is a program that manages a creative world, its history, people, creatures, places, factions, and relationships, compiled together into a wiki-like database. This makes writing new content more consistent and more rewarding, because you can see your whole universe expanding bit by bit with every paragraph you add. Once you have a world, you can easily use it for a D&D campaign using built-in features within World Anvil. Loads of other tabletop rule sets are supported too, by the way. World Anvil also makes a great database for supporting general creative writing, like a novel. You can write straight into the program and link in the lore materials you've made already. That makes it really good for collaborating with other writers, since you all have the same connected lore. And the ability to arrange and show off your world is great when it comes to publishing and selling content too. You can check out World Anvil via our link in the description. If you use our code WIZARDS, they'll give you 40% off all recurring memberships, so support our channel and your imagination by taking a look. As the increasingly dark days of the First Age of Middle-earth hurtled towards their ultimate conclusion, the Dark Lord stood upon the precipice of total victory. The sons of Feanor were scattered and prone to fits of violence in their pursuit of the Silmarils, which unintentionally aided Morgoth through the destruction and disunity they wrought. Nagathrond and Doriath, once proud bastions of the Free Peoples, a bulwark upon which the innumerable hordes of orcs would be broken time and time again, were naught more than smouldering ruins. The House of Hador, once a proud and formidable foe of the Dark Lord, had been reduced to a fractured and broken entity. The trials of Turin Taramba and Hurin Thalion, and the ultimate conclusions of their tales, had brought Morgoth to the verge of the victory he had craved since the first coming of the Noldor to the shores he sought dominion over. Yet one kingdom still resisted, a hidden city within a valley the Dark Lord had never fully been able to bring within his dominion. Unfortunately, the city's location had been revealed with the capture of Maeglin, and the greatest advantage Gondolin maintained had been lost forever. This elf, formerly held in high esteem amongst the Gondolindrim, had brought to the darkest depths of Angband the cornerstone of what was to be Morgoth's crowning achievement. Under the pressure of torture, in conjunction with the greed and jealousy which resided within the very core of Maeglin's soul, he revealed the location of the hidden city. Maeglin was then allowed to leave, with the hopes of becoming the king of the city under Morgoth's suzerainty, and to ensure this outcome, he would act as a spy within the city for the Dark Lord. Morgoth had also learned much from the Nurnaeth Anuidiad, wherein his impatience and underestimation of the forces arrayed against him had allowed a spark of resistance to remain amongst the Free Peoples. The Elves and Edain of this age had long learned to live with little more than the glint of hope upon the darkest days to persist in their struggle. Therefore, the Dark Lord knew that to ensure for good and all that he would dominate Middle-earth for the millennia to come, even this fragment of hope must be extinguished permanently. For many long years, Morgoth drew to him all the strength he could muster. Morgoth would also send his finest lieutenants, the Balrogs and vast numbers of dragons who were of Glaurung's brood, to complement the innumerable hosts of orcs that comprise most of his armies. Meanwhile, Maeglin would continue to undermine the city from within, a smile on his face disguising the evil held within his heart, which, even though she was unaware of the cause, brought a great gloom over Idril. So it was that when Tuor and Idril's son, Erendil, was not more than seven years of age, the hammer blow of Morgoth was to come, one which even a city as well fortified and defended as Gondolin could not withstand. The great host of Angband issued across the northern hills, 
which were greatest in the height of the city's hinterland, and as such was the least fortified and garrisoned against such an assault. Morgoth had brought to bear all the cunning he could gather, as the attack was to coincide with the Feast of the Gates of Summer. All of the Gondolindrim were awaiting the coming of the sun to sing uplifting songs to celebrate another sunrise free of the dominion of Morgoth. Unfortunately for the residents of the hidden city, the light was to come from the north and not the east. Therefore, the hosts of Angband were able to reach the walls of Gondolin unopposed. Despite the immense fortifications erected and the Gondolindrim's might, even before the assault had commenced, the hope of throwing back the tide was little more than a vain one. Our chronicler recounts, Of the deeds of desperate valour there done by the chieftains of the noble houses and their warriors, and not least by Tuor, much is told in the Fall of Gondolin, of the battle of Exelion of the Fountain with Gothmog, Lord of Balrogs, in the very square of the king, where each slew the other, and of the defence of the Tower of Turgon by the people of his household, until the tower was overthrown, and mighty was its fall, and the fall of Turgon in its ruin. As the sun rose and the battle was brought to the hidden valley in FA 510, the Gondolindrim steeled themselves to face whatever came their way. Even as the hope of their people was extinguished in one fell swoop, the denizens of the last great elven city of Middle-earth refused to bow to the terror which now threatened to engulf all who now bore arms against the great enemy. Turgon was to lead the defence as the High King of the Noldor. However, it was not long until the defenders were driven back to the citadel and slain. Exelion and his House of the Fountain had been held back in reserve under Turgon's direction, but upon witnessing the great destruction wrought by the forces of the Dark Lord, he went forth into the fray. The great Warden of the Gate charged at the head of his house, and met the orcish vanguard head-on, with the impetus of a force far more significant than which he could possibly bring to bear. The orcs were driven back with such ferocity that the gate was almost regained. However, it was at this point that the dragons of Morgoth reinforced the retreating orcs. Ecthelion's wrath was such that his very name became a war cry of the elves, and in his fury he laid low two dragons and three balrogs. However, in the melee, the outnumbered House of the Fountain, supplemented by Tuor's House of the Wing, was forced to retreat. The ever-valiant Ecthelion led the rearguard action, unwilling to give even an inch of ground as his comrades retreated further into the city. His left arm was wounded, causing his shield to clatter to the cobbled streets. The great Drake Oroloke was to assault the rearguard after depositing the balrogs he had carried upon his back. The dragon would almost trample Tuor and Ecthelion, but the former was able to wound the fire drake's foot, causing him to scream, spout flames, and lash out with his tail, slaying Orc and Eldar alike in the process. Injured and unable to fully defend himself, Tuor was to carry Ecthelion away to rejoin the remaining leaders of the city within the square of the palace, where a final great defence of the city was to be mounted. Although Ecthelion had been grievously wounded, he was able to heal himself by drinking from the great fountain of the king, reclaiming enough strength so as to be able to lead the defence of the hidden city once more. Seven dragons would lead the assault upon the square, but undaunted, the remaining Gondolindrim met them with all the remaining strength they could bring to bear. Unfortunately, the enemy's strength was so great that all of the defenders, except Ecthelion and Tuor, were slain. And it was here that one of the greatest duels of the age was to commence. For the very slayer of Fëanor, Lord of the Balrogs, Gothmog, had come forth at the behest of Morgoth and sought to lay low the most valiant of the heroes of that age. Tuor initially rushed forth to meet this towering behemoth, yet despite his own martial prowess and courage, he was easily brushed aside by the flaming blade and whip of the Lord of the Balrogs. Now all that stood between Gothmog and the Fountain of the King was Ecthelion, the Warden of the Great Gate. The very finest remaining member of the Noldor met his foe within the square, displaying an incomparable grace and strength. Despite the exhaustion which had caused his face to take upon the whiteness of grey steel, in terms of the skill displayed, 
Their duel was only matched by Fingolfin in his doomed struggle against Morgoth before the gates of Angband. Yet as was the case in that duel centuries earlier, Ecthelion was ultimately no match for Gothmog, and was wounded by the Balrog, causing him to drop his blade. However, just as Gothmog was to end their fight, Ecthelion sprung forth and wrapped his legs around the Lord of the Balrogs. Sufficiently pinned, Ecthelion drove his spiked helm deep into Gothmog's body, causing the pair to fall into the Fountain of the King. Neither would ever emerge from these watery depths, even as the city was raised around them. Likewise, Turgon, who was among the Citadel's defenders until the battle's very end, was laid low by the crushing tide of Morgoth's servants. Even this most ardent defender of the Free Peoples could not stem the tide of Morgoth's malice and cruelty. In the end, the hubris of the High King of the Noldor was to bring not only his own end, but that of his people and the city he loved with all his heart. Following this duel and the death of the High King, Tuor realized that the city's fate had been sealed, and sought out Idril and Erendil. The vainglorious Maeglin had sought to claim Idril as his own, and laid hands upon her. Tuor arrived just in time to prevent any darker outcome, and upon the city walls the pair fought. Tuor, weakened by the struggle against the hosts of the Dark Lord, was able to draw upon some last reserve of strength, and cast Maeglin from the walls of Gondolin to his end. From here, the trio gathered what Gondolindrim they could, and sought to leave the city through the secret passages in the mountains, which had been hidden beneath the dwelling house of Idril and Tuor. Glorfindel, who had fought within the square at the side of both Tuor and Ecthelion, was given command of the rearguard, a position he took to with characteristic valour, losing many warriors in the doomed defence of the refugees. However, as the group continued to make its way through the Kirith Thoranath, the second greatest of the Balrogs, Lungothen, descended upon them. Without a moment's hesitation, Glorfindel strode forth to meet his doom, aware that even though victory was an uncertain prospect, his sacrifice could ensure the survival of his comrades. The duel was conducted masterfully by Glorfindel, who held off the whip and claws of Lungothin before shattering the Balrog's iron helm. In the final moment of their fight, Glorfindel impaled Lungothin in the stomach with his blade. As the Balrog began to fall over the cliffside, he grabbed Glorfindel by his hair, causing them both to fall into the deep abyss and to their death. The king of the eagles, Thorondor, would then recover the body, and Glorfindel was buried upon the high cliffs of the mountains surrounding Gondolin. It is said that beautiful yellow flowers grow upon his grave, despite the rocky composition of the soil, as he maintained his silent vigil over his desolated home. Tuor would lead the remaining survivors through the mountains, whereupon they would travel to the mouths of the Syrian. There, the refugees would merge with the even smaller group of survivors led by Elwing and forging for themselves a minor settlement of sorts. Word would reach Morgoth of the survivors who had made their way from the ruin of Gondolin relatively unscathed. However, in his arrogance, he thought little of these weary survivors of a destroyed kingdom. For he believed his victory to be complete, with naught more than the fractured sons of Feanor left to challenge him, and even then, their oath had brought little but woe to those who had opposed him in years past. As such, the thought of his eventual downfall at the hands of those who eked out little more than a bare existence upon the mouths of Syrian could not have entered his mind. Yet as we will come to see, darkness cannot ever truly overpower the light, if even a bare ray of hope remains to illuminate the path. Our tale of the history of the First Age will continue with an episode on the War of Wrath, which will bring about the Second Age of Middle-earth. The next few videos in this series will be dedicated to the last desperate battles of this age before the sundering of Beleriand in the War of Wrath, but we're planning to cover the battles of many other fantasy, sci-fi and space opera universes, so make sure you have subscribed and pressed the bell button. Please consider liking and sharing as it helps immensely, and don't forget to comment. We'll try to read and respond to every comment as we want to know what you think about this video and which videos you hope to see in the future. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel, and we'll catch you on the next one.